Support for this and all the free content of Addressing Gettysburg is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Yes, no. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, much better. Okay. All right. Well, I would just like to welcome all of you today to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Angie Atkinson. I'm one of the supervisory park rangers here. And it is my honor today to introduce our speaker, licensed battlefield guide Mary Turkmino. Mary is a retired attorney and has been a licensed guide at Gettysburg National Military Park since 2016. She practiced law for 35 years, focusing on employee, employer-sponsored employee benefit plans, retirement, health care, and executive compensation, largely for Fortune 100 companies headquartered in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Mary was regularly recognized by colleagues and clients through listing as one of the best lawyers in America for several years before her retirement. Mary received her undergraduate degree in music performance from Baldwin Wallace College Conservatory of Music and her law degree from Temple. So uh, please give Mary a warm welcome and I hope you enjoy today's talk. Okay, thank you Angie. Can everybody hear me all right? Is this on? Angie? Hold on. Technical difficulties always at the beginning. Let's make sure. Yeah, you should. Okay, do I need, I need to move it closer, huh? Okay, we'll put it here. This is like guiding 101, right? Is that better? Okay, cool. Uh, well, let me add my welcome to Angie's this afternoon. It's a privilege for me to be here. This afternoon, what we're going to do is leave the battlefields of the Civil War and instead talk about the battles that took place in the halls of Congress and in the meeting rooms of the Congressional Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. I remember to turn that on. In these battles, President Lincoln and powerful congressional leaders vie for power and influence, while military leaders fight for fame and advancement, as well as their own reputations. It's not pretty. In fact, it's often pretty ugly, as passions run high not only to save the Union, but to advance careers. Some of the actions taken are principled, genuinely testing the structure of the national government, while others are driven by petty disagreements and jealousies. We begin at the beginning in 1861, with the United States entirely unprepared for war, something you're familiar with. The country is in need of military leaders and arms and must develop a military and manufacturing infrastructure to support the war effort. In a country less than 100 years old, it also needs a government with experienced leaders who understand and can pull the levers of a complicated governmental structure not yet fully tested in wartime. A governmental structure that purposefully divides the war-making power and authority in order to limit the possibility that any one person or any faction could wage war. The nation struggles to find men who can lead, equip, and inspire large armies. Military leaders and their wartime tools are often found by trial and error. Military leaders and their war, um, the government finds itself in a similar position. The new president is an inexperienced, self-educated, one-term congressman from the West with no significant military experience. The North is politically divided with at least four separate identifiable groups, each with its own set of wartime goals. Who would emerge to lead the government? The story of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is an important one and often overlooked as the nation struggles to find its way through its most challenging crisis. A president trying to learn on the job, experienced congressional leaders asserting themselves in what they think is a leadership vacuum, all looking for a way to win the war the way they define winning it. For us, it's reality TV. Let's see. Now we're going to see how this works. There we go. First, as a backdrop, we'll put our lawyer hats on. 
don't hold it against me. And look at the constitutional framework and the actions taken in the first few months of the war as various leaders assert their power and authority. What drives their actions and how successful are they? What leads to the creation of the Committee on the Conduct of the War? Then we'll look at the early activities of the committee as it flexes its power and how the Lincoln administration reacts and interacts with this powerful congressional committee. We'll take a closer look at the committee hearings following the battle here at Gettysburg, called the Meade hearings. In these hearings, we see the best and worst of these politicians and soldiers trying to manipulate both the leadership of the country and the Army of the Potomac. Finally, we'll look at how the committee's role changed during the war, and once its work was complete, how it affected the careers of the men involved. Does it still affect how we think about the battle of Gettysburg and the men who fought here? Did it change how our government functions during wartime and peace? At the beginning of the war, the federal government is still viewed largely through the design of the founders as expressed not only in the Constitution, but also in the Federalist Papers. The framers had created a complicated system of three branches of government. However, there was no historical template to guide their interactions or define where powers ultimately would reside among these branches. Guidance in the Federalist Papers is scant and most often purely theoretical. And we'll see the Constitution is both maddeningly specific and annoyingly general. There was a desire to limit the powers of the executive, so the executive did not become a king, but provide the executive with enough power so that the nation could survive a crisis. But where were the lines to be drawn between congressional and presidential power? This looks a lot harder than it is, um, but bear with me as we go through this process quickly. When we look at the Constitution, we find the Congress has some very specific war-making powers assigned in Article I, Section 8 on the left-hand side of the slide. They, of course, have the power to declare war by 1861. This had been done twice previously, before the War of 1812 and the Mexican War. But there had been other uses of military force in our history for which Congress did not declare war. When was it necessary? Congress has the power to raise and support armies, but with a two-year limit on funding. They can call forth the state militias to execute United States law and suppress insurrections. And Congress can organize, arm, and discipline state militias and govern these state militias employed in the service of the United States. By contrast, on the right-hand side of the slide, the executive has some very broad and previously undefined powers assigned in Article II. In Section 1, the president is provided with executive power. It's vested in the president. What does that mean? And what is an executive power? And Section 2 of Article 2 designates the president as the commander-in-chief. What does that mean? Although the president has broad, undefined powers, Congress's war-related powers act as a check on these broad presidential powers. When Fort Sumter is attacked in April 1861, Congress is not in session. In fact, not all the elections have been held yet for that 37th Congress. Its first regular session isn't scheduled until December of 1861. In Congress's absence and within his executive authority, Lincoln, the lawyer, finds the rationale to act in the crisis. He calls a special session of Congress to begin July 4th of 1861 to deal with secession issues and in justifying the unilateral actions he takes between his inauguration and the opening of that special session, he will eventually tell that session, it is with the deepest regret that the executive found the duty of employing the war power in defense of the government forced upon him. He could but perform this duty or surrender the existence of the government. 
For Lincoln, the inherent powers of the executive permit actions to preserve the United States. This is the first use of the term war powers used by an executive, something not specified in the Constitution. And what is it that Lincoln has done between his inauguration and the beginning of this special session? Well, we have a presidential war going on. He decides to resupply Fort Sumter. He calls for militia and increases the size of the Army and Navy. He called a special session of Congress, again, to begin July 4, 1861. In April 19th, he announces a blockade of southern ports. In May, he calls for 42,000 three-year troops, and he suspends the writ of habeas corpus in certain areas. Some of these actions are explicitly permitted to be made by the president, such as calling the special session of Congress and calling for militia, which is authorized by a 1795 law. Some of these actions stretch the president's constitutional authority. In resupplying and defending Fort Sumter against attack, Lincoln justifies his actions in the absence of a declaration of war, saying that the attack raised this issue, Lincoln's words, immediate disillusion or blood. So viewing the issue, no choice was left but to call out the war power of the government, and so to resist force employed for its destruction by force for its preservation. Lincoln sees the power to protect the government and the nation as within the inherent authority of the executive of the government. Some of these actions were probably unconstitutional. We don't think of Lincoln that way much, but some no doubt were, such as calling for volunteer troops, expanding the size of the Army and Navy, this infringes on Congress, Congress's power to raise and support armies, and even perhaps suspending the writ of habeas corpus. They'll fight over that for years. Whole different program. Lincoln does not specifically defend these actions when he addresses that special session of Congress. He says instead that these actions, and I want you to read them along with me, isn't this fun? These measures were ventured upon. Yeah, these measures, whether strictly legal or not, were ventured upon under what appeared to be a popular demand and a public necessity, trusting then as now that Congress would readily ratify them. It is believed that nothing has been done beyond the constitutional competency of Congress. In full view of this great responsibility, I have so far done what I have deemed my duty. You will now, according to your own judgment, perform yours. It's now Congress's turn to decide how to react to Lincoln's actions. Before we talk about what Congress does, let's take a look at our 37th Congress. We'll take a quick look at it. Both the House of Representatives and Senate are heavily Republican although we'll see that there are factions within that Republican Party. More than 60 members of the House withdraw, are expelled, or fail to show, mostly from southern states. And in the Senate, there are 19 vacant seats. Who's the odd guy? Tennessee. Andrew Johnson. Excellent. All of those that have withdrawn, just about all, are southern Democrats. And let's take a look at these political factions because they're important to our story. We have two main factions in the Republican Party, Lincoln's Party. Radical Republicans want to destroy slavery and remake the South in the image of the North, a free labor, free soil economy. Moderate Republicans desire to reunify the country, but they're content to prohibit slavery in the territories and let it die a natural death in the South. Yep, okay. Next slide. And then we've got the Democrats. They're not united either. The war Democrats are fiercely pro-union and ambivalent about slavery. They oppose the expansion of federal power. We've got a couple examples up there. And the peace Democrats, those guys we call copperheads, are virulently anti-war and pro-slavely and fiercely oppose the expansion of the power of the federal government. 
When Congress convenes, they, are almost, they almost unanimously ratify all of Lincoln's prior actions, except for the suspension of habeas corpus. Again, they're going to fight over that for a long time. In addition, Congress demonstrates its enthusiasm for reunifying the country by calling for 500,000 troops. Lincoln asked for 400,000 in his address. They'll give him 500,000 for a term of three years. They pass a mild confiscation act, providing that contraband, that is slaves, directly employed by the Confederate Army were no longer slaves, but nobody pushes to try and define what they are. And they pass the Crittenden-Johnson Resolution that assures Southern states that the aim of the war is to reunite the country by promising there would be no interference with any domestic institution. In other words, the war is not an excuse to abolish slavery. Congress's resolution ratifying Lincoln's actions will state, all the acts, proclamations, and orders of the President taken after Lincoln took office, respecting the Army and Navy of the United States, and calling out or, re or relating to the militia or volunteers from the states are hereby approved and in all respects legalized and made valid. So they may be thinking about some of these being unconstitutional and an infringement on Congress as well. They go on to say as if they, these actions are legalized and made valid as if they had been issued and done under the previous express authority and direction of the Congress of the United States. By the close of the special session, August 6th of 1861, everybody's on board. Similar to the unanimity we had after the 9-11 attacks, the different political factions worked together for the common goal of saving the Union. But events soon overtake this unanimity. While Congress is still in session, new slide, a Union army is defeated near Manassas, Virginia, under the gaze of many congressmen who join the civilian crowd on that Sunday afternoon of July 21st, 1861. Congress adjourns on August 8th, but the politicking has just begun. Congress won't meet again until December 2nd, but in the fall, frustration grows over an inept Union army near Washington and another embarrassing defeat at Ball's Bluff near Leesburg, Virginia in October 1861, where U.S. Senator and Lincoln friend Edward Baker is killed in a bungled reconnaissance and skirmish. Meanwhile, John C. Fremont, commanding the Department of the West, declares martial law in Missouri on August 30th, 1861. In that proclamation, he confiscates all property, including the slaves of those of Missouri who support the Confederates. While cheered by the radical Republicans, Lincoln worries this declaration will push the remaining border states toward secession. Believing Fremont has exceeded his authority as a military governor, on September 11th, Lincoln publicly revokes the Emancipation Clause and in November 1861 removes Fremont from command, much to the dismay of the radical Republicans. These Union military defeats under the command of West Point trained soldiers confirm the belief of many radical Republicans that there is little value to professional military training and that West Point is a breeding ground for unpatriotic, even treasonous military leaders, many of whom are active Democrats. Lincoln's actions regarding Fremont convince the radical Republicans that Lincoln is a weak leader and not committed to emancipation and remaking the South. During the fall of 1861, many of these congressmen stay in Washington and are actively meeting with government officials advocating for their way to win the war. And when Congress reconvenes in December 1861, radical Re Republican congressmen look for ways to invigorate the war by asserting themselves into the military and political leadership of the war. During this session of Congress, December 1861 to March 1862, several actions are taken intended to push more radical wartime goals, and most importantly for our purposes, on the opening day of the session, a bill is introduced in the House creating a committee to investigate the military disasters at Manassas and Ball's Bluff. 
Within days, a similar bill to create an investigative committee is introduced in the Senate. There are debates on the floors of both chambers and discussions behind closed doors, testing the notion that Congress has the power to oversee the military and the prosecution of the war by the Commander-in-Chief. Following days of discussions, the Senate debate resumes on an amended bill now authorizing Congress to investigate every military disaster. And by the next day, a concurrent resolution is overwhelmingly passed in both houses of Congress, authorizing a joint committee consisting of three senators and four congressmen to examine all aspects of the war and will have the power to send for persons and papers, in other words, to force testimony and to force papers to be provided to them. Congress has now asserted itself, and it's now in the game. Senator Benjamin Franklin Wade, an influential radical Republican from Ohio, assesses the committee this way, the importance of the committee this way. The function of the committee was to secure for Congress and the radicals a dominating voice in the conduct of the war and the formulation of war policies. Both houses now move full steam ahead to name members and get the Joint Committee up and running. We'll come back to the slide, but take a quick look at it. Here's that committee. Radical Republicans, lots of them, right? The most influential members are Ben Wade, Senators Ben Wade and Senator Zachariah Chandler. We'll talk about that them and give you a sense of what they're like. And in keeping with most Civil War presentations, we've got to have black and white photos of men, right? Ben Wade is a radical Republican and proud of being a radical. In Lincoln's War by Jeffrey Perrette, Perrette describes Wade this way. He's age 61. He radiates force with a high, broad brow and cheekbones like marble slabs burning eyes and a sledgehammer chin. It was an Easter Island head on a living man's frame. <laughs> James Garfield describes Wade this way. He's a man of violent passions, extreme opinions, and narrow views, who is surrounded by the worst and most violent elements of the Republican Party. And remember, Garfield's an Ohio Republican. Wade has a long history of public service, both in Ohio and in the U.S. Senate. And just one example of Wade's combativeness, he wrote to Zachariah Chandler, fellow radical Republican, about Lincoln's reversal of Fremont's emancipation order in Missouri. Wade writes, Lincoln's order was foolish, impolitic, and meant that in Lincoln's opinion, the right of a man to his slaves is more sacred than the right to his own life. Such ethics could only come from one born of poor white trash and educated in a slave state. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Wade. Our other influential radical Republican, Zachariah Chandler, I don't want to run into him in, a, in an elevator. He was a party kingpin in Michigan. Like Wade, he has a simplistic approach to the war that he expressed in a letter to a friend November of 1861. Chandler's take, Lincoln means well, but has no force of character. He is surrounded by old fogey army officers, more than half of whom are downright traitors, and half of the other half sympathize with the South. One blow upon the Potomac, another at Memphis, and a third all simultaneous at Charleston or Savannah, and the thing is virtually ended. Easy way, right? So says Zachariah Chandler. All right, so as you can see from this list of committee members, it's heavily weighted toward radical Republicans who have a suspicion of Lincoln and a bias against West Point generals. No member of the committee has any military experience, and all are unfamiliar with military matters, such as weapons, military strategy, logistics, and army training. 
This lack of knowledge does not change throughout the life of the committee, either as a result of study, as it did with Lincoln, or experience. Lincoln is wary of the committee and realizes these powerful congressmen think they have the right to set war policy. Generally, he'll meet with the committee members when they request it, which is often, and he'll placate that committee when he has to. But he does not buckle to many of their demands. The committee sets its own operating rules. We've had recent examples of this, I'm sure you're familiar with and they, entail, or they are tailored to enhance the power of the committee. All testimony is taken in secret and is to be kept secret until July of 1862 when the committee members realize the benefit of leaking certain testimony and they will begin to do that. No quorum is necessary to take testimony and so much of the committee's testimony is taken by one or two attending members, most often Wade and Chandler. Witnesses may not talk to the press. They are not represented or accompanied to their testimony by a lawyer, and they may not confront or cross-examine other witnesses. Some may say that's a stacked deck. Okay, yep, we're halfway through and it's just decided not to go. Come on. All right. Between 1861 and 1863, the committee investigates the military disasters at Manassas and Balls Bluff, the removal of John C. Fremont, and the inactivity of the Army of the Potomac because of its proximity to Washington and its apparent incompetence. The Army of the Potomac becomes an easy target as the committee attempts to push an aggressive prosecution of the war. In the spring of 1863, at the end of the 37th Congress, the committee publishes three volumes, which include testimony of nearly 200 witnesses, including 100 generals. The report includes not a single useful military rec or legislative recommendation. However, it's printed in large quantities for general consumption, printed in many of the newspapers and in pamphlets. It becomes a propaganda tool. There's some, there some additional fallout from the activities of the committee, and these include a reinforcement of the hostility between West Point trained military officers and civilian leaders. It encourages staff officers to be critical of more senior officers, creating opportunities for ambitious junior officers and feeding jealousy and distrust among the officer corps. And it reinforces the committee's simplistic notion of warfare. That is, forward motion and frontal attack over maneuver. And this may well have influenced the actions of field officers who feared investigation and the criticism of the committee. The authorization of the committee expires with the end of that 37th Congress. It is unclear whether it will be reestablished in the 38th Congress. But by January 1864, in the opening of the 38th Congress, the committee is reestablished largely due to Ben Wade's influence and its powers are expanded. It now has the express authority to investigate war contracts and has greater subpoena power. Ben Wade is again the chairman. On a somewhat parallel track, we'll talk more about Gettysburg here. By the fall of 1863, Dan Sickles' campaign to make himself the hero of Gettysburg goes public. Meade is aware of the public criticism of his leadership, and in late December of 1863, Meade writes to his wife, I understand there is a bitter article in Wilkes' in Wilkes's Spirit of the Times asserting that Hooker planned the campaign at Gettysburg and that Butterfield wrote all the orders for the movements in accordance with Hooker's plans. I furthermore hear that General Sickles asserts that Hancock selected the position and that Sickles, with his corps, did all the fighting at Gettysburg. So I presume before long it will be clearly proved that my presence on the field was rather an injury than otherwise. Late in 1863, as the committee prepares to again investigate the Army of the Potomac, there are several interested parties, all with their own agenda. The radical Republicans, our good friend, General Dan Sickles, and several other senior officers president at Gettysburg. 
let's talk about these interested parties and what they're looking for. For the radical Republicans, by the end of 1863, the radical Republicans have become frustrated by the failures of the Army of the Potomac under Meade to go after Lee immediately after Gettysburg and into the fall of 1863 at Mine Run and Bristow Station. To them, it's starting to look like McClellan all over again. Lots of maneuvering and lots of missed opportunities. These radical Republicans also feel that Meade is not sufficiently political. He's a West Pointer and he doesn't share their passion for emancipation and total war. The committee's dilemma is who to replace Meade with. Their solution is to rehabilitate Joseph Hooker after Chancellorsville. They hold hearings on the Battle of Chancellorsville for this purpose. Hooker has ingratiated himself to the committee by adopting their wartime goals. He talks tough and now believes in emancipation. Dan Sickles. In the meantime, Dan Sickles has been active, active, openly declaring himself the hero of Gettysburg. After being wounded at Gettysburg on July the 2nd, he's in Washington by July the 5th, and shortly thereafter visited by President Lincoln. By this visit, Lincoln has started to spin his story about Gettysburg and the importance of his actions to the victory. As a steady stream of visitors arrive, Sickles, probably, Sickles' story probably becomes more grandiose, and pretty soon he's invested in it, or perhaps delusioned by it. Sickles returns to New York City in late July 1863 and is welcomed as a hero. He can't back down now. On October 1, 1863, George Meade files his Gettysburg report. Although Meade's report is not overly critical of Sickles' actions at Gettysburg, he gives Bernie credit for saving the Third Corps from its advanced position on July the 2nd. By mid-October, Sickles is sufficiently recovered to meet with Meade at Meade's Army headquarters on October 18th, requesting reinstatement to his Third Corps command, even though he admits he's not ready to come back permanently. As you can imagine, Meade declines. And within two days, Sickles is back in Washington, meeting with Lincoln and Stanton, looking for an assignment. Then on November 15, 1863, Henry Halleck issues his report of the Gettysburg campaign with far more pointed criticism of Sickles. His report states, General Sickles, misinterpreting his orders, had moved Third Corps nearly three quarters of a mile in advance an error which nearly proved fatal in the battle. The enemy attacked his corps on the second with great fury, and it was likely to be utterly annihilated when the fifth corps moved up on the left and enabled it to reform behind the line it was originally ordered to hold. Well, as you can imagine, this is more than Sickles can take. In December, Sickles is in Washington requesting that Lincoln open a court of inquiry to correct those mistakes in Meade's and Halleck's reports. Lincoln declines. So Sickles' aim of returning to his command and saving his reputation are now aligned with the committee's goal of removing Meade in favor of Hooker. We also have other Army of the Potomac officers during the winter of 1863 and 1864. While the Army is in winter quarters, many of its senior officers are jockeying for position in the midst of rumors of an Army reorganization. Old jealousies, many which never seem to go away, and self-preservation take hold during the Army's inaction. Many of these officers will be called as witnesses giving them an opportunity to burnish their own reputation, often at the expense of others. It is in this atmosphere, rife with self-promotion and jealousy among the military class and the continued desire of the radical Republicans to shape the wartime goals, that the Meade hearings take place. The hearings begin in late February 1864. Seventeen witnesses are called to testify, a who's who of senior generals from the Army of the Potomac. We'll take a look at, at those with some of the most influential testimony, both for and against George Meade. And as we look at this testimony, 
put that lawyer or juror hat back on. It's important to evaluate that testimony in light of whether the witness testifies about firsthand knowledge or hearsay. He's heard it from somebody else. Whether the witness's statement is consistent with any prior statements, for example, their official report filed about the Battle of Gettysburg, the character of the witness, and any biases the witness may have. And many of these witnesses have plenty of biases. With an eye toward its gold, the committee stacks the early testimony with anti-Mead witnesses, Dan Sickles, Abner Doubleday, and Albion Howe. Of these, Sickles and Doubleday, but especially Sickles, set the table for the remainder of the testimony. So let's take a look at the bias of both Sickles and Doubleday. Sickles, we know, we don't need to say much about all the baggage he brings with him. He's got a general reputation for poor candor and manipulation, and he wants his third corps command back, but Meade has already refused it, so he's self-interested here. And because he didn't write an official report, he has the benefit of not having to worry about any prior statements. Abner Doubleday continues to be bitter about his removal from First Corps command on the evening of July the 1st here at Gettysburg. He's an avid abolitionist, which aligns him with the radical Republicans. As the testimony opens in late February 1864, Sickles and Doubleday level five charges against George Meade. Charge number one, Meade really didn't want to fight here at Gettysburg, and for this they cite the Pipe Creek Circular. Charge number two, Meade wanted to retreat from Gettysburg on July the 2nd. This charge is based largely on the retreat plan developed by Butterfield at Meade's request. Charge number three, Meade failed to promptly pursue Lee's retreat. Charge number four, Meade failed to attack Lee once his army was trapped against the Potomac River. And charge number five, Meade was timid and a military failure who lost the support of his officers. We don't have time to go through all five of these and look at the testimony. We'll focus on charge number one and charge number two, but it'll provide a flavor of what goes on in these hearings. As the first witness, Sickles sets the table with some wild accusations. The Pipe Creek Circular was a retreat order, didn't you know? Sickles reads into the record only the first two paragraphs of the circular that support his position, leaving out portions that indicate the order is contingent on a change in circumstances. An analysis of the entire Pipe Creek Circular finds eight different phrases and actions indicating and sections indicating the contingent nature of that order. None of these are read into the record. And Sickles opens the door to the charge Meade wanted to retreat from Gettysburg on July 2nd by saying, I suppose that on Wednesday night, July 1st, he undoubtedly intended to fight there at Gettysburg, else he would not have concentrated there. But I have reason to know that his plan of operations was changed on Thursday, July 2nd, and that he resumed in substance the plan that he had on Wednesday morning, which was to fall back to Pipe Creek or to some place in that neighborhood. Sickles never offers any support for this statement, and there is no cross-examination of Sickles, with only one exception, the only committee member present during Sickles' testimony are radical Republicans. And the questioning, such as it is, is done by Ben Wade. The committee's bias against Meade aligns with Sickles' agenda, so they have no interest in pointing out the additional portions of the Pipe Creek Circular that contradict Sickles, that is, if they've ever read it. And they have no interest in further probing about some July 2nd retreat order. Doubleday reinforces Sickles' testimony by criticizing Meade for failing to move more quickly to Gettysburg and implying he didn't want to fight there, implying. He also infers that there was a July 2nd retreat planned, but indicates he has no direct knowledge of it. Although Doubleday files an official report, there is no intimation in that report of any order to retreat on July the 2nd. Like Sickles, there is no cross-examination of any of Doubleday's statements, 
Only radical Republicans of the committee are present, and they hear just what they want to. On the night of July 4th, following the testimony of Sickles, Doubleday, and Howe, another anti-Mead witness, Wade and Chandler demand a meeting with Lincoln and Stanton to urge the removal of Meade. They've already heard enough after three stacked witnesses. What's the urgency? Well, two days earlier, what happens on March 2nd, 1864? Ulysses S. Grant has been appointed Lieutenant General and will have authority to name Army commanders. Wade and Chandler want to move while they still can before Grant can assume active command. Grant's reputation is unassailable, and the committee realizes that once he's in command, their influence over the choice of Army commanders will be gone. However disappointed Lincoln is of Meade's caution after Gettysburg, he's unconvinced Meade must be replaced. Unable to convince Lincoln, the committee goes back to work. In early March, and let's find the slide that shows all of these. Here are the witnesses that the committee will hear from. In early March, Meade arrives in Washington on business. He's been called to Washington by Stanton to discuss the reorganization of the Army of the Potomac. When he arrives, he begins to hear the buzz of certain grave charges made by Sickles and Doubleday. This is Meade's first indication he is under attack. In a letter to his wife on March 6th, Meade describes his activities on March 5th, and we'll find out about them with his own words. He tells Marguerite, when I reached Washington, I was greatly surprised to find the whole town talking of certain grave charges of General Sickles and Doubleday that had been made against me in their testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War. On Saturday, I was summoned before the Committee. I found there only Mr. Wade of Ohio, he was very civil, denied there were any charges against me, but said the committee was making up a sort of history of the war and was now taking evidence to enable it to give an account of the Battle of Gettysburg and my administration since commanding the Army. I then occupied about three hours, giving a succinct narrative of events. Subsequently, Mr. Stanton told me, and Marguerite, this is strictly confidential, that there was and has been much pressure from a certain party to get Hooker back in command, and that thinking through Sickles and others they might get me out, they had gotten up this hullabaloo with the committee. But that I need not worry myself, there was no chance of their succeeding. When asked at the end of his testimony whether there was anything else me would like to say, he responds, I would probably have a great deal to say if I knew what other people had said. In his appearance before the committee, Meade has not had the luxury of reviewing any of his papers, any official papers, does not know what prior testimony has been provided, and is not represented by counsel. In retrospect, Meade's off-the-cuff testimony given on March 5 is remarkably accurate and a competent defense of his actions. In a few days, Meade requests to provide additional testimony to the committee and appears again on March 11th. This time, he comes with several of his orders in hand to support his prior testimony. He's focused on the charge that the Pipe Creek Circular was evidence he did not want to fight at Gettysburg. Meade is the first to place the entire Pipe Creek Circular into the record and concludes by saying, I trust that a careful perusal of these orders, with the explanations I have made here as to the time at which they were written or received, will satisfy the committee that my only doubt about fighting at Gettysburg was, was caused first, was caused by first the unknown position of the enemy and secondly, the character of the ground. That the moment these points were made clear to my mind, there was no hesitation on my part to order my troops up there and fight the battle out at that place. The very next day, March 12, 1864, the first historicus letter appears in the New York Herald. Whether written by Sickles or someone close to Sickles, we'll let Jim Hessler we'll, uh, defer to him on that. It's another shot across Meade's bow. 
By March 15, now fully aware of the charges against him, Meade writes to his brother-in-law, my enemies consist of certain politicians who wish, we, who wish me removed to restore Hooker, then of certain subordinates whose military reputations are involved in the destruction of mine. Finally, a class of vultures who in Hooker's day preyed upon the army and who sigh for a return to those glorious days. I expect to retain my place, but I am anxious about my reputation. By now, the rest of the committee is wise to what the radicals are up to, and Daniel Gooch, a moderate Republican, and Moses O'Dell, a war Democrat, now jump into action, attending the testimony of additional witnesses and actively questioning those witnesses. Together, they provide competent cross-examination of several of the witnesses extracting testimony favorable to George Meade, but the radicals push on continuing to assail George Meade through additional witnesses. On April 1st, 1864, Meade testifies for the last time about the Gettysburg campaign, and he strongly and emotionally defends himself, saying, I utterly deny, under the full solemnity and sanctity of my oath, that in the firm conviction that the day will come when the secrets of all men shall be made known, I utterly deny ever having intended or thought for one instant to withdraw that army unless the military contingencies which the future should develop during the course of the day might render it a matter of necessity that the army should be withdrawn. I base this denial not only upon my assertion and my own veracity, but I also show the committee from documentary evidence the dispatches and orders issued by me at different periods during that day, that if I did intend any such operation, I was at the same time doing things totally inconsistent with any such action. Seth Williams, a very strong pro-Mede witness, he's the Assistant Adjutant General of the Army of the Potomac. He testifies on April 18th. And under questioning by Gooch and O'Dell, Williams testifies that while he was handed the July 2nd retreat order, he was instructed not to issue it until directly ordered to do so. He testifies that that order never came. His testimony is strongly supportive of Meade and his intention to fight at Gettysburg on July the 2nd. Gooch and O'Dell also established through questioning that Williams is the guy who would know if there was any retreat order. Williams also confirms that Meade's contingency order was not retained in the official records, yet another indication it was never issued. Testimony in the Meade hearings ends on April 27, 1864, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Meade has provided a spirited and adept defense that seems to dampen the enthusiasm of the committee for its goal. Between Meade's clear and decisive defense, the appointment of Grant as General-in-Chief and Lincoln's assertion as a strong Commander-in-Chief, the committee has lost its appetite for interference in military strategy and personnel. The committee now turns its attention to atrocities, such as the massacre of U.S. colored troops at Fort Pillow in April 1864 and the treatment of Union POWs in Confederate prisoner of war camps. During the remainder of 1864 and into 1865, it uses its bully pulpit as a propaganda machine to whip up indignation against the South. This inspires continued support for the war and encourages the need, of harsh, the need for harsh reconstruction, perhaps the new but unstated goal of the radical Republicans on the committee. The committee winds up at the end of the 38th Congress in the spring of 1864, 1865, the very last report that it issues is the report on the Meade hearings, published May 22, 1865. Needless to say, by 1865, its impact is minimal. It has no effect on the careers of Meade or Hooker. It affects no military strategy and recommends no legislation. The war is over, and the North is won. Lincoln is dead. The attention of the nation and the radical Republicans is now focused on Reconstruction. The committee helps establish the precedent 
for robust congressional investigative committees exercising Congress's oversight role as Congress continues to assert its authority through its implied power of oversight. Congressional oversight committees include oversight of reconstruction, but notice none of the members of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War are assigned to the Joint Committee on Reconstruction. Congress will also investigate the Teapot Dome scandal, the sinking of the Titanic. They'll hold hearings on un-American activities and many more that we're familiar with right up until today. And this is perhaps the most important legacy of the committee. Ben Wade becomes president of the Senate in 1867 and according to the succession rules then in place, he is next in line for the presidency when Andrew Johnson is impeached. He votes for Johnson's conviction, but many say the conviction falls short because of concern that Wade would become president. Wade is not reelected in 1868 and his political career ends. He returns to his law practice in Ohio and dies in 1878. Zachariah Chandler remains in the Senate until 1875 and is then defeated for re-election. He serves as Secretary of the Interior in the Grant administration and then returns to the Senate in 1879. But his return is short-lived as he dies at the end of October 1879. Much of the testimony taken in the Meade hearings reverberates through history as many of the participants continue to battle for their reputations and their place in history. General Sickles continues to tell the story of his importance at the Battle of Gettysburg for the next five decades. And he continues to charge that George Meade wanted to retreat from Gettysburg on July the 2nd. Abner Doubleday recounts in the 1880s his version of the battles of Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, repeating some of the more damaging testimony against Meade. And the Doubleday-Meade controversy continues beyond Meade's death in 1872. Colonel George Meade, his aide-de-camp, will publicly continue to fight over this July 2nd order in the newspapers now, the New York Times. Over time, the opinion of historians about the impact of a committee changes. In 1941, historian T. Harry Williams believes the committee was the most potent weapon the radical Republicans had to influence the course of the war. More recently, Bruce Tapp concludes that the committee was largely ineffective because of its lack of military experience and its adverse impact on relations among military officers and the civilian government. Tapp concedes, however, that several investigations did uncover corruption, atrocities, and financial mismanagement during the war. Ultimately, he believes Lincoln became strong enough to repulse many of the committee's attempts to influence his actions. As the judgments of historians change over time, it's undeniable that the testimony before the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War continues to provide fodder for historians. Much of the testimony continues to be cited as truthful. The witnesses were, after all, under oath, regardless of the questionable reliability of some of those witnesses. When you read accounts of testimony before the committee, hopefully you'll now have more context in which to evaluate the truth of that testimony. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes? Uh, I saw a little chart that you gave there. You mentioned that some were anti-need, neutral, yeah. pro me. I see Two slots occupied by. Sorry, Sorry two slots occupied two by. Two slots occupied by the same name. And the yes, same yes, and that's because. Let me go back. Yeah. Wads. There are some. Um, it, some things they have pro me testimony for, some anti me testimony, or neutral. So they they don't need they don't all neatly fit in a single box. Well, here's the second part of my question. Yeah. The pressure from the committee make uh, officers in the field more aggressive than they might have been 
and maybe perhaps reckless? Uh, because of uh, the committee's view of how to, how to prosecute the war? And you don't pursue the enemy more strongly. You're going to be investigated. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing written. I mean, nobody writes. Well, because the committee, um, so we don't know for sure, um, but what would you do? Do you want to be investigated by Ben Wade and Zachariah Chandler? So, yeah, so, it, so I think there's certainly some evidence of that, but it's certainly not direct evidence. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh, the guides are here. <laughs> Why do you think that it was only radical Republicans that were running the show during the hearings? Um, at the beginning, it's just the way things had been done. Um, a lot of these moderate Republicans and war Democrats could care less. It's really intended to be a tool. It always was designed to be, and you can tell by who gets assigned to the committee. It's intended to be a tool for the radical Republicans. You got to put some other guys on, but they're not very active for the most part. And and only I mean this is a good example of where they will eventually rally to the defense of an officer who they think is under unfair attack. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but by 1863 they've had a couple of years to operate and they begin to see what's going on. Um, but they're not nearly as invested in this, not as fanatical as these radical Republicans are. Great question. Others, yeah. The uh, union of faith that involves Bluff, that union general, his career suffered after that because this committee. Had, so how many other uh, union generals or all high-ranking officers were uh, careers uh, sidetracked or uh, did you ever get a count? I, you know, I haven't gone back, back and tried to get a full count of that. Um, it's very clear that the committee tries to encourage and to put in positions um, generals that they favor. They want generals who will fight an aggressive war, who agree with them about wartime goals and especially abolition. Um, an, an example, an opposite example, is John C. Fremont. Once he gets removed, the radical Republicans are up in arms. And they will push and push and push Lincoln until he finally decides, okay, so I need to put Fremont somewhere to get these guys off my back. Where shall I put him? I'll put him out west. And he immediately fails. So he's certainly one that benefits from, um, from pushing by the committee. The most obvious example of a general whose career is sidetracked by the committee is George McClellan. They hate George McClellan. He's a Democrat. He doesn't believe in abolition. He wants a a nice, friendly war. And they push and they push and they push. Lincoln, a lot of these um, early investigations are to get to McClellan. And they will eventually do that. There'll be a space between the time they have some of these hearings and Lincoln finally relieves McClellan but a lot of that is Lincoln just trying to put some space there so it doesn't look like he's been influenced by the committee. In that, in, in that situation, they tend to, they, they actually agree, but he doesn't want to show he's being influenced by them. Yeah. Well, Stone has the same problem. Absolutely. And, and unfortunately, he even has to pay for himself going to prison. I, that's right. For it. That's right, after Ball's Bluff. And again, they're looking for a scapegoat. They don't want it to be their senator. They got to find somebody else. And they will actively manipulate testimony to get the result they want. Yeah, not a nice bunch of guys. Not looking for fairness, are they? Okay, any other questions? Great questions. Yeah. During the fifth quarter, Paul Marshall, I see this charge, I don't know where it comes from, that the radical Republicans wanted to prolong the war in order to, have you ever seen that? Yeah, the the question is about John John Fitzporter and his troubles, shall we say, Um, and and some statement that the radical Republicans wanted to prolong the war. Um, I've not seen that specifically. Uh, Yeah, I don't don't know. After the war that they, they came up with? 
Or the writer herself? Yeah, that one I don't know. I've seen it repeated. Okay, I'll have to look for that one. Thank you. I will do that. There, one of the things that's interesting about this is no matter how deep you dig, there's more and more and more there. Um, and lots of good primary sources, so it's fun to do that with. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you surprised that Mead wasn't removed from command? Um, am I surprised that Meade wasn't removed from command? Uh, Lincoln's pushing back pretty hard, and he also, Meade also, has the very strong support of Stanton and Halleck. Stanton is kind of playing both sides of this. Um, the, Wade and, and Chandler will meet with Stanton almost every morning during the war, continuing to browbeat. Stanton is going to play both sides of the, of the aisle here. Um, he will very strongly support Meade. He's the one that tells Meade, hey, watch out, these guys are out for you, when nobody else has really told him that specifically. And in fact, Wade has denied it. Um, so he has the clear support of, you know, Lincoln's not happy with him, but he's not going to remove him after Gettysburg, I don't think. Um, and then, and, and then you get Grant coming in, and Grant is going to support him as well. I, we know Meade submits his resignation multiple times to Grant, and Grant always says, no, 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 stay here. Um, so I think with that support, that gives Lincoln enough to push away the demands of the committee here. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? Yeah. When I look on the anti Meade side, too, yep. I mean, there's like some guys up there that really have kind of a personal oh, absolutely. grudge against me. The, oh, absolutely. You know, one I, of them I think maybe a little bit justified, but the other three, you know, it's basically they're just trying to cover up their own incompetence. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of that. So, you know, so the point. and uh, Butterfield and Sickles, I mean, well, you know, this is easy from this point of view, you know, because we can look back and say, well, they don't really right. have any credibility. Right. Where Doubleday kind of got, you know, on the shaft, but... He certainly thinks so. Yeah, and, and of course, I can understand why he might have been a little bit upset, but the other guys... Well, let's talk about Albie and Hal for a minute. Well, that's enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sickles and Doubleday, they're the first two to testify. What can they testify to? Charge one, charge two. Where were they during the retreat? gone. Okay, so what they need to do now is get Howe in there because he's the only one of these guys that was even with the Army of the Potomac during most of the retreat. Howe's problem is the day before he testifies, he's been reassigned back to Washington in the reorganization of the Army of the Potomac. He's not a happy camper. So he blames me for that. And he's just as anti meat as the rest of these guys. The, the Butterfield stuff is fascinating. If we can take just a couple of minutes. I had to take that out because I kept taking stuff out to try and get within the time frame here. But the Butterfield story is a great one. Um, so Sickles and Doubleday testify. Howe testifies. And something's going on here between Sickles and Butterfield. Because where's Butterfield? by February, by January, February of 1864. He's out west with Hooker. Okay, he's Hooker's chief of staff. He goes AWOL to come east. And coincidentally, by the time he gets to Washington in January of 1864, Sickles has already requested Wade to make available all of the official documents so that Butterfield can look at them again. And then Butterfield testifies. He testifies two days on a Friday and a Monday. Friday, he's pretty anti meat and he's going to talk about that retreat order, although he's not very, he, he's kind of waffling about it. By Monday, they've gotten to him, and he gives much stronger testimony on Monday. But as a general matter, Butterfield's testimony is, is pretty disappointing to Sickles because He's not going to say, yep, I saw that July 2nd retreat order. He can't say that, and he doesn't. Um, but Butterfield certainly has a bone to pick. And, and what's Butterfield's bias in all this? Well, he's a hooker guy. Well, he's a hooker guy, but what happens if Meade gets removed? Hooker comes east, and Butterfield's going to come with him. 
He's going to be chief of staff. Okay, he's going to be chief of staff of the Army of the Potomac. Instead of the end up with Humphreys. Right. Right. Okay. So all of these guys here in the anti-me category, they all have biases. And what's remarkable to me is that you can read in lots of very good books published in the last 20 years, their testimony quoted in these books for the truth of the statement. It's like, what? Did anybody pay attention to what was going on? But somebody finds the quote, hey, it's congressional testimony. It must be true, right? <laughs> so I, again, you can pick and choose what you take from this testimony to support a position. Yeah, well, right. I mean, sometimes me turns out to be a very, um, very reliable witness, a, a good veracity. But he's got biases, too. He's worried about his own reputation. Butterfield are all lying. <laughs> well, we know, we, yeah, I mean, we know that now. I think we do. Some people do. Okay. But there, you know, there's plenty of squish in this. Um, but and all the anti me guys are pretty substantially anti me Yeah. And what's the other thing we know about George Meade? He's not a warm, fuzzy guy. No, he's not. Okay? He's not a good politician. He's not a good politician. He won't play their game. Um, Meade will write about Hooker. By 1862, he's figured Hooker out. Hooker will say anything they ask him to, which is why the committee likes Hooker. Wasn't Meade a former McClellan man? Was I'm sorry? Wasn't Meade a former McClellan man as well? Oh, yeah, which is part of why the committee doesn't like him. The whole Absolutely. Well, again, large portions of it. And another interesting part of this is um, the, the anti-West Point bias. Where does that come from? And, and, I mean, it's too much to go into today. But there's an incredibly strong anti-West um, Point bias. Um, even in 1863, Ben Wade introduces a bill in Congress to abolish West Point. <laughs> So these, these guys have got the West Point guys, um, they're staring right at them. They don't like them. OK, other questions? Awesome. OK, have a great March 1st. Great to be here.